Hello, and welcome to Real Cheating Story. The screen door swung open, and Mrs. Fielding heard the rapid patter of footsteps. A young voice exclaimed, Mama, Mama, there's a new girl in school. The teacher made her sit by me. I think she's nice. She rode the school bus home tonight and sat by me and everything. She said her daddy was the new preacher. Can I have her come over sometime and play? Janice Fielding smiled warmly and pulled her six-year-old son into her lap as he skidded to a stop beside her chair. Slow down, son, she gently urged. I'm glad you made a new friend. Why don't you tell me all about her while we wait for supper? After her parents have settled into their new home, we'll talk about having her and her family come for a visit. After Alex had exhausted his excitement about his new friend, Janice asked, Now, do you have homework you need to do, young man? When Alex nodded, she continued, Well, you know the rules. Homework first, before anything else. Now get busy. As Alex trudged into the kitchen to tackle his homework, his older sister, Barbara, wandered in. Seeking their mother's attention, Mrs. Fielding smiled affectionately at her nine-year-old daughter, recognizing her eye-rolling response to her brother's antics. Meanwhile, Janice's thoughts drifted to the new family in town. She recalled the moving van she had seen departing last Friday, likely the one that had delivered their furniture. Janice felt a sense of responsibility to welcome the newcomers and ensure they felt at home. She was particularly pleased to hear they had a child around Alex's age. Living on their small family farm about two miles from town, there weren't many children nearby for Alex and Barbara to interact with. Deciding to extend a warm welcome, Janice resolved to bake a nice cake after supper. She and Alex would take it down to the new family's home, allowing them to introduce themselves and make the newcomers feel welcome in their community. Later that evening, Mr. Fielding came rattling up on the combine as she was putting the food on the table. He was in the middle of harvesting their soybeans, so she knew he wouldn't be interested in going with them. During the meal, she told him she was going to town for a short time after supper. Before she could explain, young Alex chimed in again. Yeah, Dad, there's a new girl in school. Mama thinks they moved into that old house on the edge of town last week. That's where she got off the school bus tonight. My teacher told her to sit by me, and she asked me to take care of her. She's really nice. Can I have her come over and play? Donald Fielding looked at his wife and smiled, then turned to Alex. Of course you can, son, but remember she may not want to spend all her time here. After all, she might be a city girl and may want to do things with her friends. Before heading back to the field, Donald walked around the table and leaned down to give his wife a gentle kiss. Even after all these years, his touch stirred her deeply. She constantly prayed Alex and Barbara would one day find someone who made them feel that way. She loosened her grip and watched him stand tall. I'll probably be late again tonight. I still have almost 200 acres to cut, and I'll work as long as it's dry enough. I have to get the beans in so I can get ready to plant the wheat. Janice felt a little sad. He seemed much too young to look as tired and worn out as he did. She knew he loved his life on the farm, but it was hard work. Even with her help, one man had trouble managing the whole 1,640 acres, especially during busy times. She looked into his eyes and whispered, I love you, honey. Please be careful out there while we're gone. Try to come in early. I don't want you getting hurt because you're too tired. Alex could barely wait for his mother and sister to finish cleaning up after supper. Come on, mom. It's getting late. Let's go. Finally, everything was done to her satisfaction, and she smiled down at Alex. Okay, honey, go get in the car, and we'll go. During Barbara's visit with the new family, Alex's mother discovered that Alice was an only child. She learned that Alice's father had grown up in the same town where he met and married Don in college. Even after 11 years of living in Steelville, Alice didn't know everyone or the names of many children who had grown up and moved away. Alice's grandmother still lived in the house where Mr. Fowler had been raised. He had served as a pastor in a small church near his college until his mother informed him that the town's only surviving church was looking for a new minister. He applied for the position, which, despite its low pay due to the small congregation, was a chance to return home. He and his wife sought part-time work to support their family, planning to stay in town indefinitely. This marked the beginning of Alex's long friendship with Alice Fowler. Like most young people, their friendship went through ups and downs as they matured. When they were younger, 
Alex thought of Alice like other girls. Fun to play with, just one of the boys. However, as they grew older, Alice became more reserved for a few years. Being the daughter of the town's minister, she attended services with her family three times a week and was heavily involved in church activities, including visitations, weddings, and funerals. Reverend Fowler and his wife became respected members of the community, always helping families in need and fostering beneficial programs, including an after-school program for local youth. This program brought Alex and Alice closer together, and they would often tell anyone who would listen that they planned to marry someday. As they entered their teenage years, their feelings for each other cooled, typical of many young relationships. Most parents in Steelville worked in nearby cities, as the town itself had become a bedroom community. To support the families in town, Mrs. Fowler decided to open a daycare center at the church for local children, accepting them on a regular or occasional basis as needed. Eventually, her daycare became so popular that she had to hire help, which, along with Reverend Fowler's church salary, provided a comfortable life for their family. One of the women she hired was Alice's grandmother, and this was where Alex first met her. Sometimes, when his mother needed to run errands, they used the church's babysitting service. As Alex grew older, he didn't require much supervision, but he was sent to the daycare until he was old enough to stay home alone. It was there he first met Hope Fowler, whom he came to see as an honorary grandmother. Their bond grew as they played board games and sometimes croquet, with Alice joining them frequently. As they all matured, Alex, Alice, and their friends became curious about the opposite sex. They would occasionally sneak away from the daycare to visit Grandma Hope or explore other houses. From that point on, they spent more time together, often with friends, whether swimming in the local stream or enjoying each other's company. Alice, in particular, had many more male friends than female ones, establishing herself as one of the most popular girls in school. Just after they turned 18, Alice helped Alex understand how to make a girl feel good. Alex always felt excited yet nervous when they were together. The first time he brought Alice to that point of pleasure, he worried he might have hurt her. No, you dummy, she reassured him. That felt wonderful. I screamed because you made me feel so good. One evening, while in town, Alex saw Alice in a car with one of the older boys, sharing a kiss. The next day, he asked her about it and she told him that Jason was her boyfriend. Heartbroken, Alex felt hurt, believing they had something special. After a while, Alice stopped dating Jason and was seen with several other boys, but none of those relationships seemed to last long. Rumors about Alice began circulating at school and throughout the town, but Alex refused to believe them. He knew Alice wouldn't do what the others claimed. When Alice was single again, Alex asked her out on a date, and this time she said yes. Overjoyed, they started dating in the spring of their senior year and continued through college until the Christmas break of their freshman year. They enjoyed all the typical experiences young couples share, and Alex realized he was truly in love with Alice. Finally, during spring break, they shared a special moment together, which Alex found incredibly exhilarating. They spent that date in a cabin his family owned, and Alex felt overwhelmed by the experience understanding why it was often discussed among older boys and girls. Unfortunately, during their first intimate moment, he was so caught up in the excitement that he didn't last as long as he had hoped. Alice looked at him, playfully frustrated. No, not yet. Oh, Alex, how could you? I was just getting started. Embarrassed, Alex apologized, saying, Honey, I'll make it up to you. Just give me a minute to rest. She sat on the edge of the bed looking displeased. No, Alex. Just take me home. I can handle this myself. I can't believe I thought you could take care of me. Didn't you learn anything from those other girls? Alex, confused, asked, What do you mean? How was I supposed to learn anything from them? Alice explained, Most girls try to teach their partners how to care for them. You didn't seem to remember much about our time together when we were younger. In disbelief, Alex insisted, Alice, I promise there weren't any other girls. She shot him a skeptical look, saying, Yeah, right? Don't feed me that line. I've seen you with other girls at school. Feeling a bit embarrassed, Alex admitted, Well, yeah, but you were the first for me. Oh my God, Alice exclaimed. You mean I'm your first? I can't believe it. Now feeling a mix of embarrassment and discomfort, 
Alex got out of bed and started dressing. Alice followed suit, and without a word, they walked to his truck. He drove her home in silence, not even trying to kiss her as she hurried inside. Three days later, Alex called for another date, but Alice refused, saying she had a church commitment. Although she agreed to a couple more dates before summer, it seemed like her enthusiasm had waned, and they didn't share the same intimacy again. During the summer and fall, they didn't date at all. A week before Christmas, Alex called to see if Alice would go out with him that Saturday. She told him she couldn't because she was busy helping with preparations for the church's Christmas services. Alex was upset, but this had become a familiar feeling lately. When he called Alice, she had been frequently unavailable, citing her increased responsibilities with church activities and studying. She mentioned that her parents trusted her more now and wanted her to help with important holiday preparations. Since Alex didn't have a date that Saturday before Christmas, he decided to hang out with his friends. As they walked from the pool hall to the quick pick store, they cut through the church parking lot and heard sounds coming from one of the cars. Curiosity led them to peek inside, where they saw Alice in the back seat with Jason, one of her earlier boyfriends. Alex could hardly believe his ears when he heard Jason say, I can't believe you called me back. I thought you were going to marry Alex. Alice replied, I am going to marry Alex, but I just needed some time with you because Alex isn't very experienced. Heartbroken, Alex turned away as tears streamed down his cheeks, leaving his friends looking back and forth between him and the car. Despite their desire to stay and watch, they decided to follow Alex, hoping to console him. When they caught up, Jack, his oldest friend, said, She always was a free spirit. You know she's been with a lot of guys, right? Alex snapped, I thought she was special. I was just a mistake. Forget her. They returned to the pool hall to play a few more games before heading home. Alex never called Alice again. Three weeks later, when school started for spring, he saw her in the hallway. She attempted to talk to him, but he walked past her. Shocked and teary-eyed, Alice's friends watched in silence. One asked, What happened? I thought you two were together. Later that evening, Alice waited by Alex's truck as he left class. He tried to get in without speaking to her, but she blocked his path. Finally, he said, What do you want? I want to know why you haven't called or talked to me today. I thought we were going steady. I don't think so. I saw you with Jason in the church parking lot, and I want nothing to do with you now. Please move so I can go home. I have homework to finish. Alice collapsed on the pavement, crying. Oh, Alex. Please don't do this. I want to be with you, but sometimes I need intimacy. I know I can be the partner you want once you're ready to learn. Alex interrupted. I don't want to be with someone who plays games. I thought you were different, and now I know I was wrong. Just leave me alone. He helped her to her feet, guiding her to the sidewalk before returning to his truck. As he drove away, Alice felt defeated, tears still flowing. Passing her grandmother's house, she noticed the old lady waving and, for some reason, decided to pull into her driveway. Her grandmother greeted her with concern. Whatever is the matter, come in and talk to me. Alice slowly entered the house and sat on the couch beside her grandmother. After a moment, she began to cry again. Alex saw me with Jason at church before Christmas, and he broke up with me today. He called me a terrible name and said he didn't want anything else to do with me. Mrs. Fowler looked at Alice thoughtfully. What do you mean he saw you at church the Saturday before Christmas? I don't recall having church that day. What were you doing there? Oh, Grandma, Jason, and I were just talking in his car behind the building. Alice Fowler, what were you doing with Jason again? I thought we all advised you to stay away from him. Why would Alex call you names just for talking to Jason? Are you sure that's all you were doing? I've been hearing some unflattering things about you lately. Did you perhaps do something Alex wouldn't approve of? Alice looked at her grandmother, then ran from the house in tears. The old lady watched her leave, murmuring to herself, I'm sorry, boy. I know my granddaughter has made mistakes, and I'm sorry you got hurt by her. That evening marked a turning point for Alice. She became less cautious about her choices, and word spread that she was often involved with boys. It seemed she had a knack for attracting attention, and her charm drew men in. Alice had always had a lovely singing voice and sang in the church choir many Sundays, captivating audiences with her pure, clear sound. 
Over the years, the choir became well-known and even traveled for performances. Unfortunately, rumors began to swirl about Alice and some of the men in the choir, leading to complaints from wives, girlfriends, and mothers who wanted to protect their loved ones from her. One Tuesday night, just after choir practice, the choir director's wife caught Alice and her husband in a compromising situation. This incident resulted in Alice's excommunication from the church, and her father was asked to keep her away from the building. As a result, the townspeople turned away from Alice and her family, leading to a decline in church attendance. Her father had to step down from his ministry, and her mother's daycare business suffered as fewer parents wanted their children influenced by Alice. Some local men even began to wonder if Reverend Fowler had been too friendly with their wives. The choir director's wife eventually divorced him, citing Alice as a reason, and a picture of Alice with her husband circulated throughout town. Unable to make a living in their small town, Alice's family eventually moved away. Her father found another church to pastor, but it was never as prominent as the one in Steelville. Alice spent part of the summer with her grandmother before moving into a house with friends when college started again. Her remaining weeks in town were uncomfortable, as most women and many men avoided her, and those who did speak with her were clearly only interested in one thing. Alex didn't speak to Alice again until his third year in college. One evening, while walking back to his apartment after studying at the library, he heard a woman screaming and crying. As he approached a clump of bushes, he recognized a vaguely familiar voice pleading, No, don't, that hurts, please stop. Breaking through the bushes, he saw a tall man trying to overpower a young woman. Without thinking, Alex intervened, pulling the man away. The young man replied, Hey man, stay cool. She's been doing this all night. I wasn't going to hurt her. He pulled his pants up and walked off, leaving Alex and the girl alone. Turning to her, he heard her whisper, Thank you. I thought I knew you. Oh my God, it's you. Thank you so much. As Alex looked at her, he realized it was Alice. Well, Alice, if I had known it was you, I might have just walked by. You really need to be more careful. You could get hurt or catch something serious. Goodbye. With that, Alex turned and walked away, leaving Alice sniffling behind him. Two weeks later, when he returned from class, he found Alice sitting on the steps of his apartment. He almost turned away, but she called out, Alex, please, can we just talk? That's all I want, someone to talk to. Alex sighed and said, I suppose, come on in. Alice thanked him and expressed her gratitude again for what he had done that night on the quad. It seems like all my boyfriends lately have been real disappointments. None of them are as nice as you were. I really miss having you around to talk to. Alex smiled as he remembered their childhood and the fun they had together. He thought of the little girl he first met in grade school, the countless hours spent studying and just hanging out. Now, he looked at the beautiful woman sitting on his couch and said, Yes, sometimes I think about those days and wish we could go back to them. Alice, I know I messed up with you, and I'm sorry. But please, can't we just visit sometimes? I feel so lonely here, and I don't go home much. I don't seem to get along with people back there very well, and not many of the girls here want anything to do with me. Alex didn't say so, but he suspected her problems stemmed from her reputation. Naturally, other women would be hesitant to have her around their partners for fear she would attract them. The incident with the choir director's divorce hadn't helped her image in Steelville either. Still, he felt a pang of sympathy for her and agreed to spend time together when he could. Alice jumped up, her face lighting up with joy. Oh, thank you. She kissed him on the cheek and hurried to the door. Here's my phone number and address. Please call me. With that, she turned and left, her energy infectious as she bounced down the sidewalk. Alex thought again how beautiful she was and how lovely her personality was, wondering how someone so vibrant could find herself in such trouble. This marked the beginning of their time together in college. They never dated and never even considered a romantic relationship. Their bond remained almost completely platonic. Alex was grateful to have Alice in his life as a friend. One night after 10 p.m., Alex heard a banging on his door. When he turned on the light, he saw Alice sitting on the steps, huddled and crying. He opened the door and pulled her into his arms, helping her inside. Alice, what's the matter? Are you okay? She looked into his face 
tears streaming down her cheeks. Oh, Alex, I did it again. I just couldn't help myself. I went dancing with a boy from one of my classes. My fiancé caught us at the bar and followed us to his apartment. He waited for me, and when I came out, he took my ring and told me to forget about him. He said he didn't need a cheating partner. Alex held her tightly until her sobs quieted. Alice, you know running around on your boyfriends is wrong. It always ends up like this. Why do you keep doing it? I just can't help it, Alex. No matter how much I like the man I'm with, I get bored after a while. The excitement fades, and I know what to expect. I just need the thrill of a different lover from time to time. I know it's wrong, but I can't resist when a really attractive guy comes on to me. I get swept up in the moment and before I know it, I'm out with him. Alex sighed and continued to hold her until she fell asleep. He gently laid her back on the couch and covered her with a blanket before heading to bed himself. By the time he woke up the next morning, Alice was gone. On the refrigerator, he found a note from her. Alex, thank you for being such a good friend. I'm sorry for bothering you again. We'll graduate soon, and I probably won't see you again. Thank you for everything. I think in my own way, I love you. I've never loved any other man like this. If I can ever overcome this issue I have, I will reach out to you again. Love, Alice. Although Alex dated during his college years, he never found the right girl. Some came close, including one he thought was special until she learned he would have to serve four years of active duty with the Navy after graduation. When she found out, she left him about two weeks after Alice appeared at his doorstep. During his last semester of college, tensions peaked when Alex told his girlfriend about his active duty selection. She looked at him, her expression serious. Alex, you know my father was in the Navy. He was gone all the time, never home for my mother and us kids. He spent 20 years in service before retiring. I watched my mother fade away every time he deployed. I heard her cry night after night because he was out drinking and being unfaithful. We heard several times that when he was overseas, he went to bars and spent time with bar girls. My mother loved him and tolerated it. But I won't. I will never marry a military man. I might have made an exception for you if you had been selected for reserve service, but not active duty. I'm sorry. We could have had a chance if it weren't for that. Every nice man I've seen in the Navy is at risk and at the mercy of those girls. I know a lot of them never give in, but I can't take that chance. Goodbye, Alex. She gave him a gentle kiss and walked away without looking back, refusing to take his phone calls after that. A couple of weeks later, he saw her out with one of their classmates and finally gave up on her. For a couple of months after Petra ended things, Alex struggled to focus on his studies. Then, after midterm grades were posted, his professor of naval science called him into his office. What started as a reprimand quickly turned into a mix of criticism and sympathy. Alex. I know this hurts right now, but you have to snap out of it. If there's a silver lining, it's that you found out now instead of after marriage. You could have a bright future ahead of you, but you need to buckle down and study. I've been divorced, and I'm sure my career played a big part in that. Not all women are like your girlfriend or my first wife. Just keep looking. That little pep talk helped, and Alex began to improve. He studied hard and passed all his courses that semester. He graduated with a degree in agribusiness and was commissioned in the Navy Supply Corps. After college, he went home for two weeks before leaving for four years of service. One of his last stops before leaving was at Grandma Fowler's. Despite Alice's behavior, Grandma always regarded him as one of her own. When she hugged him goodbye, she said, Alex, you're one of the good ones. You've always treated me so nicely and cared for me more than my blood relatives. I pray I'll still be here when you come back, but if I'm not, remember me and know I loved you like one of my own. As he opened the yard gate, he glanced back to see tears running down her cheeks. She stood there with her hand raised, waving goodbye until he was out of sight. After leaving home to see the world, Alex met many women. Most encounters were fleeting, and like many Navy men, he crossed paths with a fair number of bar girls, but he always exercised caution. By the time he completed his active duty, he had gained considerable experience in relationships, ensuring that no woman left his bed unsatisfied. Alex took his time returning home from his last duty station, driving his new Super Crew F-250 Power Stroke across the country. He stopped wherever he wanted and lingered in places he enjoyed. 
meeting so many friendly people that he lost count. Truthfully, he was searching for a place to settle down. His parents were aging and wanted him to return to the family farm, but he felt uncertain about what he truly wanted. None of the women he met or the places he visited felt like the right fit. Finally, just after noon on a Thursday, he topped a rise that revealed his hometown of Steelville. He slowed down as he entered town. He had only been home once in the four years he had served in the Navy, and he hadn't been back in three years. As far as he could see, not much had changed. The pool hall was still open, but the quick bee and cafe were closed. Some new houses dotted the landscape, but several of the old ones were gone. Alex drove slowly through town and out the road toward his parents' home. He was looking forward to seeing them, but when he arrived, his father was out in the field, as usual for this time of year. His mother was sitting in the sunroom with her iced tea. She hadn't seen him drive up, and when he opened the door, she called, Don, is that you? Is something wrong, honey? When she saw Alex step into the room, she set her tea down so hard it tipped over and spilled. She rushed to him before even processing what had happened. Oh, Alex, you're home. Why didn't you let us know you were coming? Your father is out somewhere. Are you out of the Navy? Or is this just a visit? I'm out, Ma. I thought about staying, but like I told you in my letters, I like the Navy, but there are some things I just can't put up with. I'm going to stay in the reserves. That will provide a nice little income every year. If I can stay for 20 years, it'll lead to a decent retirement check when I turn 60. Now I just need to decide what I want to do. Well, honey, there's always the farm. I know your father has always wanted you to take it over and keep it in the family for another generation. He was talking to me about that just last week. It's getting harder for both of us to manage everything as we get older. Your father is 58 now, and after a hard life, he's getting around a little worse each year. Your cousins and uncles are busy with the feed and farm supply store, as well as the resort, but none of them are interested in helping here. They had to close the little lunch counter in the store to make room for a higher profit stock. We all used to go there after the cafe closed when Bessie got too ill to run it, but no one in town wanted to take on the cafe or the little coffee shop, so they both just shut down. Other than that, I guess everything is about the same as when you were here last. I'll see, Ma. Lord knows I like it here. I've been home for almost a month now and took my time driving back. I was looking for a place to live and a job I wanted, but nothing stands out like this place does. I think I have enough money saved to take my time finding a position, and the few shares I have in the business will help with income if I need it over the next couple of weeks. Alex made the rounds, renewing old acquaintances and reconnecting with his extended family. Whenever he drove to the family store, he would glance at the old quick pick store and the large, vacant building next to it. Part of that building had been the local cafe before it closed, and the rest had been a feed store at one time. It almost made him sick to see those buildings and the pool hall next door falling into disrepair. Several days while he was in the feed store, he heard locals complaining about the lack of nearby places to buy emergency grocery items or grab a quick meal. They kept asking his grandfather if he would bring back the lunch counter. A small idea began to form in his mind. With a degree in agribusiness and experience as a Navy supply officer, he felt confident in running a business. He had nearly taken a part-time position in the family business to help his father with the farm. What if he opened a small store, cafe, and service station? He didn't discuss his thoughts with anyone in the family, but took a day to walk around the buildings. They needed a facelift, but they seemed structurally sound and were in a good location. Only a block from the feed store and across the street from the post office situated on the main street through town. He found out who owned the buildings and called to see if they were for sale. After some negotiation, Alex bought the two empty buildings at a very good price. The owner kept the pool hall and told Alex he was crazy to buy the two empty buildings, claiming the town was dying. Still, Alex didn't reveal his plans. He simply told his parents he had taken on a project and could help them if they needed it, but most days he would be busy in town. In a small town, it didn't take long for everyone to realize that Alex was remodeling the old cafe and quick pick store. Eventually, people began dropping in to see the progress and questioning Alex about his plans. He admitted he was probably a bit crazy, but he planned to reopen the quick pick and cafe to see if he could make them successful. He obtained a license to sell liquor in the quick pick and planned to buy supplies for the cafe. The buildings came with a small piece of land behind them 
and after remodeling, he envisioned starting a small garden to sell fresh produce to the local residents. Alex worked through most of the winter on the buildings. He borrowed his father's machinery to plow the eight-acre vegetable patch and eagerly awaited spring to plant his crops. He opened his store and cafe in late February. Business was slow but steady. After the first month, he was breaking even. One day, he received a phone call from a chief petty officer he had known in the Navy. She had retired and was looking for a place to work and live. Alex remembered her as an excellent cook with a small child and no husband. Sir, it's not chief anymore. I'm retired. Remember my name is Marin now. What were you going to say? She interrupted. Alex chuckled. Well, Marin, I guess there are two things. First, I'm not a lieutenant or sir. I'm just Alex. Second, I've opened a small cafe and quick pick store here in Steelville. I also promise to help my parents on the farm and am raising vegetables to sell commercially. If you're interested, I could hire you to cook and manage the cafe while I'm away. I can't pay much, but there would be living quarters for you and your daughter. The local school is good too, and I know you'd fit in well here. What do you think? Well, Alex, I've always wanted to move back to a smaller town. I grew up in one, you know? I'll come and see what it looks like. It sounds interesting. You sure made Steelville sound nice when we talked about our hometown. I can be there in about three weeks. Is that okay? Alex sighed with relief. Great. That'll be fine. I'll get busy working on your quarters. He had been considering turning the unused part of the cafe into one or two small apartments. So that's exactly what he started doing. By the time he finished, he had created two apartments of about a thousand square feet each. He lived in one, and Marin and her daughter moved into the other. While he was working on the apartments, the owner of the pool hall approached him about buying that building. He wanted to retire, and the pool hall wasn't even covering its insurance and expenses. After inspecting it, Alex made an offer, and the owner accepted without hesitation. Once he finished the apartments for himself and Marin, he began converting the pool hall into more apartments. There were already two in the upper floor, but they hadn't been rented in years and needed significant renovation. Alex added two more on the ground floor. By the time he finished, all four apartments were rented, covering utilities and insurance for all the buildings and leaving him with some extra for living expenses. Things were looking up for Alex, and he was enjoying his life. He worked long hours in his businesses and on the farm with his father, but it felt fulfilling. There was, however, one thing missing. He hadn't found a significant other yet. Most of the young people his age were either married or had left town. He was never fond of meeting potential partners in bars. He preferred to visit larger towns for short encounters, but he was hesitant to get serious after some experiences he had in the Navy. One hot summer morning, Alex sat in the cafe, chatting with farmers and town residents who were enjoying breakfast or taking a break. He heard the doorbell tinkle and looked up to see the most beautiful woman he had seen in months walk in. She turned left and entered the cafe. When he remodeled, he had made the cafe and quick pick doors the same, so one clerk could handle both businesses. As she approached, Alex recognized her immediately. Hey, stranger, she said with a smile. How are you doing? It's been a while. Hello, Alice. I guess it's been almost five years now. How have you been? I heard you got married. What brings you back to town? Well, I'm staying with grandma for now. I guess you could say I got a taste of my own medicine. I was married but I caught my husband cheating, so I'm waiting on the divorce to be final. After that, I'll need to find a better job. Right now, I'm working part-time at the YMCA while I'm here. Still in the Navy? Alex asked. No, I got out almost a year ago. I didn't want to do anything away from here until I came home. Alex had been trying to make a little extra income in the cafe and store. He was getting by, but at least he was living where he wanted to be. As they continued talking, the lunch crowd began to fill the small cafe. Alice, I'm sorry, but I have to get busy now. Marin needs help with the lunch rush. It was nice seeing you again. That first visit had Alex thinking about Alice once more. He enjoyed their conversation and felt very comfortable with her. Somehow, she seemed more mature and relaxed than before he went into the service. Two days later, Alice came back into the cafe for her morning coffee. Once again, she and Alex visited and he was disappointed to see her leave. The next time she visited, Alex was filling in for Marin because she was enrolling her daughter in school, 
so he didn't have time to chat with Alice. They exchanged brief greetings, which left him feeling frustrated. During one of his short stops at her table, Alex did something he had sworn he wouldn't do again. Alice, I've really enjoyed visiting with you these last few weeks. Would you like to go to Centerton with me Friday evening for supper? Okay, she replied. What should I wear? There's a really nice French restaurant there with a nightclub attached. Why don't you wear something nice, and we can eat there? When he arrived at Mrs. Fowler's home to pick Alice up, she met him at the door. She looked at him thoughtfully as she let him in. Boy, are you sure you know what you're doing here? Alice is my granddaughter, and I love her. But anyway, it's good to see you again. I've missed our talk since you got so busy over there at the store. Come on in. She's being fashionably late as usual. Alex and Alice dated through the fall, and he found himself falling for her deeply. However, he grew frustrated. While she seemed to attract attention, she was holding back in their relationship. He respected her resolve and admired how she had turned her life around. Finally, Valentine's Day arrived, and Alex was determined to make the night special. Before they left her grandmother's home, he suggested doing something different. How about we go shopping first instead of going right out to supper? Shopping? Alice exclaimed. It's Valentine's Day for goodness sake. Why do you want to go shopping today? Well, I thought if you were interested in getting married, you might like to pick out an engagement ring, he said. Alice's mouth dropped open in surprise. After a moment of silence, she wrapped her arms around him, leaning in for a kiss. Yes, I think I would really love to go shopping with you tonight. Alex glanced over Alice's shoulder and caught sight of her grandmother watching them with a disapproving expression. She shook her head and turned away, leaving the room. The day after Alice's bachelorette party, Alex's sister Barbara visited him at the cafe around 3 p.m. She had a serious look on her face and went straight to the point. Alex, let's go to your apartment. We need to talk. A wave of anxiety washed over him. He feared the worst, especially after hearing that their mother had been unwell for almost a year. Before they sat down, Barbara poured them each a drink and began to speak. Alex, I don't know how to say this, but it needs to be said. Have you lost all your sense? What possessed you to ask Alice to marry you? You know what she was like when we were younger. She's divorced now because of cheating. Getting more frustrated. Alex interrupted. Hold on, Barb. I know she used to have her wild moments, but she's changed. I was pretty reckless in the Navy, but I'm not like that anymore. Besides, she said it was her husband who caused the divorce. Barbara took a deep breath, looking concerned. I wasn't invited to her bachelorette party, but I made a point to find out where it was and went to the bar uninvited. Alex, if she's turned over a new leaf, then I'm the Queen Mother of England. She danced with all the men and seemed to enjoy their attention. There were times when she was out of my sight for 30 to 45 minutes. I wouldn't be surprised if she got involved with someone else during those times. Alex, you really should rethink this decision. Alex stared at his sister feeling a surge of anger. You spied on Alice? Now you want me to dump her? She's the only woman I've ever loved enough to ask to marry me. I know she was a little wild, but she's over that now. Heck, I remember seeing you at a bar before you got married, and you had your wild moments too. Should I tell David about your past and warn him that you might cheat? I don't want to hear any more about this. Alex got up and walked back to the cafe. Barbara sat there for a few more minutes then sighed and followed him inside. She stopped beside his chair and said, Alex, I'm sorry. You won't hear another thing from me about Alice, but I felt I had to make the effort. I love you, and I really don't want to see you get hurt. I hope and pray you're right and I'm wrong. She leaned in and gave him a gentle kiss on the cheek before leaving for home. Alice and Alex had a June wedding and took a week off for a short honeymoon, but Alex had to return quickly to tend to his vegetable patch and summer work on the farm. He had hired Pablo the year before, and while he was a great help, Alex still needed to be there during the busy season. Alice wasn't thrilled about the short trip and complained about it often. Alex found himself wondering where the sweet woman he had dated had gone. Alice continued to work part-time at the YMCA, which was about 20 miles away. She didn't want a more demanding job, but she enjoyed the extra income and appreciated the social interaction with her friends there. Alex offered to help her find a job in the cafe or store, but Alice refused, 
insisting that she wanted to keep her job at the Y to maintain those friendships. Alex began to worry about her wording, so he dropped by her work unannounced from time to time. After several visits, he felt reassured. Most of the customers were women of all ages, and although there were more young men using the weights when college started, they were mostly younger than Alice, so he didn't think they would be a problem. As time passed, their intimacy was strong, better than he had expected. At times, Alex thought Alice was quite affectionate, and he even looked forward to her periods for a chance to rest. He had to admit that the old rumors were right. She was fantastic in bed. Time progressed, and Alex was happy. He and Marin fine-tuned the menu, and on Friday and Saturday nights, they began serving some continental cuisine. Their business picked up, prompting them to hire a young woman named Brandy to help in the cafe and store. More people began traveling from Centerton, almost 70 miles away, to dine at their restaurant, and sometimes patrons waited over an hour for a table. Alex's sister had a friend in Houston, Texas, who sent him a newspaper clipping featuring a glowing review of his restaurant. As word spread, more customers came, and he decided to redecorate the unused part of the building behind the cafe, transforming it into a full-service restaurant. He added a patio with tables under three large shade trees for patrons to enjoy in nice weather. With the growing demand, Alex started taking reservations and eventually expanded to offer full service from 6 o'clock in the morning for breakfast until 10 o'clock in the evening. He kept the original section of the building for local walk-in customers, maintaining the name Steelville Cafe, while the restaurant became known as Alex's Place. Although both sections had separate menus, any meal could be ordered in either area if the restaurant was open. Many times, Alex would leave people without reservations waiting, even if they had traveled a long distance, so he could seat his neighbors in the cafe. As business boomed, Alice began to express her frustrations. She wanted him home in the evenings and craved more intimacy. To address this, Alex made sure to be home two evenings a week, and they stopped serving dinner on Mondays and Tuesdays. Alex routinely drove to Centerton to shop at Sam's Club and other supply houses for groceries and ingredients for the restaurant. He could buy items retail at those establishments and bring them back to Steelville at a lower cost than purchasing from delivery trucks. This allowed him to keep his prices competitive. So many residents chose to buy their groceries from him instead of going to town. To accommodate his growing business, he expanded the store and installed freezers and additional coolers for produce and meat. His next project involved taking orders for produce and delivering it on shopping days. He found he could charge a bit more for delivered produce than customers would pay at local grocery stores, but they appreciated the convenience of fresh items delivered right to their homes or offices. By now, Alex was making nearly as much as he had during his time in the Navy, and he was enjoying his work. After nearly two years of marriage, Alex and Alice welcomed their daughter, Julia. Alex thought she was the most perfect baby he had ever seen, but Alice seemed less enthusiastic. She expressed frustration with the time it took to care for a baby and often complained about feeling like a dull, boring mom. A year later, their son Samuel was born, and Alice insisted on having her tubes tied afterward, saying she didn't want to have any more children. Alex was hurt by her attitude but chose to overlook it, as she seemed to be a good mother, and he adored their children. Within a few months of Samuel's birth, Alice regained her slim figure and made good use of her access to the YMCA facilities where she worked. However, she soon began to express her boredom and wanted more to do. She encouraged Alex to let her buy supplies and deliver produce, saying it would allow her to meet people and have a social life while helping him out. Since she had friends in Centerton and the other towns he delivered to, she looked forward to visiting them during her trips. Alex thought this was a great idea and agreed to let her handle the errands. Unfortunately, there were times when he needed her to return quickly, especially on market days. Sometimes, it would be late in the evening before she would get back, which led Alex to reconsider. Alice, this can't continue, he said one day. There have been too many times when I needed something and you didn't return in time to use it or miss sales because we were out of stock. I think I'll start making the shopping trips myself again. I'll leave at 6.30 a.m. and be back before lunch. Alice became frustrated. Why? If you're out of something, just use a substitute. You know I always get home before dark, Alice replied. I admit, sometimes the girls and I lose track of time, but that happens to everyone. It sounds like you just want to keep me on the farm. Well, 
I'm going to town a couple of days a week to visit my friends, whether you approve or not. With that, she turned and left the business, tires squealing as she sped out of the parking lot. Alice began making trips to town around 10 o'clock in the morning to spend time with her friends, sometimes not returning until after 6 o'clock in the evening. At first, it was just once a week, then twice, and eventually she started going on Saturdays too. Alex noticed she sometimes came home with the scent of alcohol, raising concerns about her drinking habits. Eventually, Alice's behavior became so apparent that Alex couldn't ignore his worries any longer. One morning, as he was leaving Sam's parking lot around 10.30, he spotted Alice's car pull into the holiday and parking lot across the street. Another car followed her in and parked next to hers. Alex's heart sank as he watched Alice get out, walk to the driver's side of the other car, and greet a tall, well-built man. They embraced, and Alice shared a kiss with him. Stunned, Alex sat in his truck, unable to move. When the couple turned to walk arm in arm toward the hotel, Alex quickly parked and rushed inside, arriving just in time to see the man sign the registration. To his dismay, he recognized him as Jason, one of Alice's former boyfriends. Partway to the elevator, Alice stood on her tiptoes and kissed Jason again. Alex watched helplessly as they entered the elevator, feeling a heavy weight of sadness settle over him. On the way home, he couldn't shake the thoughts that haunted him. He should have seen this coming, despite the warnings from Barbara and Hope. The next morning, he sought help from a couple of friends in law enforcement who regularly handled security and investigative cases. Over coffee at the cafe, he confided in them about his suspicions regarding Alice and Jason. I followed them to the Holiday Inn. They kissed several times, then went up to her room. I need proof that she's cheating on me. Three weeks later, during another coffee meetup, his friends handed him a large manila envelope. Jack said, Alex, you were right. It's worse than you suspected. We have pictures and a detailed account, but you should probably give it to your lawyer without looking at it. It seems Alice has been very active with multiple partners. Alex's heart raced as he processed this information. He had already spoken with an attorney, Steve Jensen, a family friend for nearly 40 years. That evening, Alex called Steve to let him know he had the necessary documentation for the divorce. The next morning, Steve stopped by the cafe for coffee and picked up the envelope. I'll review this and make any necessary changes. Do you still want her served as soon as possible? Yes, I plan to ask her to leave the house the evening she's served. I don't want her to run off before then, Alex replied. Two days later, Steve returned to the cafe. We're serving her at the YMCA this morning, just after she arrives for work. Good luck. Shortly after, the cafe phone rang and Marin answered. She pulled the receiver from her ear, looking frustrated. Everyone in the room could hear the yelling coming from the phone. Alex glanced up at her and said, I guess that means it's my turn. Marin looked at him, acknowledging the situation. Yes, I guess it is. Whatever it is, Alice is really upset with you. What did you do to make her this angry? Well, Marin, I imagine she just found out about the divorce papers, Alex replied. What? I didn't know you were having any trouble. I'm sorry, I asked. Taking the phone, Alex listened as Alice vented. Once she had calmed down, he said, Alice, I never should have married you. The only good thing I have left from our marriage is the children. I knew you hadn't changed, and now I have proof. Don't come home. I've changed the locks and stopped the credit cards. After hanging up, Alex walked into the kitchen where Marin and the staff were working. I guess most of you heard part of that. All I will say is I caught Alice cheating and I filed for divorce. From now on, I don't want anyone telling her anything about the business or doing anything she asks. I'll try to keep you all out of the line of fire, but we all know how Alice can be when she's angry. Everyone offered support, patting him on the shoulder or giving him small hugs, expressing their sympathy. Later that evening, Alice arrived in town with Jason and another man. Alex received a call from a neighbor, reporting that someone was trying to break into his house. He quickly grabbed his coat and drove home, calling the sheriff on the way. When he arrived, he found Alice and one of the men banging on the door. Just as he opened his truck door, Jason attempted to kick the door in. Go ahead and try that, and I'll have the cops arrest you for breaking and entering, Alex warned. Jason turned to face Alex, saying, You think you're tough? Open that door right now. 
or you'll regret it. Alex, feeling threatened, reached under his coat and revealed his pistol just as Alice saw it. Her expression changed as she said, Stop, Jason. He's serious. He has a gun. Turning to Alex, she said, Since you're being so difficult, I've decided to take my things and move to Grandma's. Are you going to open the door? Or do we have to do this the hard way? Alex replied, Stand back from the door. I'll let you in, but you can only take your personal belongings. The rest will be decided in court. Alice smirked at the mention of court, but the three of them moved aside just as a sheriff's car pulled into the driveway. The deputy stepped out and asked, What's going on here? We got a complaint of a possible burglary. Alex and Alice spoke simultaneously, but he stopped and let her continue. Divorce, and he won't let me in to get my clothes. The deputy looked over at Alex. Is that true? Alex replied, Not entirely. I caught her cheating and filed for divorce. I changed the locks on the house. I was just about to let her in to collect her clothes when Jason tried to kick the door in. He pointed out the footprint left on the door. I would appreciate it if you could stay until she gets her things. Alice and her friends moved through the house quickly, leaving a mess as they gathered what she deemed her belongings. Once they left, the deputy shook Alex's hand. I'm really sorry to see this, but I'm not surprised. If you need us again, just call. Alex drove back to the restaurant to finish the evening. As he passed Mrs. Fowler's home, he saw her standing in the doorway with a shotgun. Alice and her two friends were there, arms full of her clothes. Alex pulled to the curb and walked into the yard, hearing Alice plead, But Grandma, you have to let me stay with you. Alex kicked me out of the house, and I don't have anywhere to go. Mrs. Fowler looked up at Alex and asked, Is that true? Did you kick her out? Yeah, I'm afraid I did, Alex replied. You were right. Some people don't change. Mrs. Fowler turned back to her granddaughter. Did you get caught cheating again? I don't want your kind living here with me. You and your friends should leave. Alice, in tears, walked back to the truck with the two men. Alex and Mrs. Fowler watched as they got in. Alice sitting in the middle, leaning on Jason's shoulder as they drove off toward the nearest town. The case worked its way through the courts and finally came to a hearing. Alex and his attorney, Steve, entered the courtroom feeling confident. They believed they had all the necessary testimony and evidence prepared. After presenting their case, the judge recessed for lunch, planning to reconvene at 2 p.m. When court resumed, the judge leaned back in his chair and began speaking. I find in favor of the defendant, Alice Fielding. She is awarded a divorce on the grounds of extreme mental cruelty from her husband, Alexander Fielding. Never in my long career have I seen a case such as this. Mr. Fielding, a man does not own his wife. No one has the right to restrict their spouse's freedom or friendships. Custody of the two minor children is awarded to Mrs. Fielding, with Mr. Fielding allowed supervised visitation one afternoon a week. Should he be found with a weapon during this visitation, further access will be denied. The judge continued, Additionally, Mrs. Fielding is awarded half of the business and 60% of the savings and investments. She will also receive the house and the lot it sits on. Each party will retain their current vehicles and personal belongings. I award $800 per month in child support to Mrs. Fielding and $500 per month in alimony. Her maiden name, Fowler, will be restored to her effective today. Alex and Steve sat in shock as the judge's words sank in. The outcome was staggering. Alice was receiving about 75% of their combined assets and half of Alex's net income. Although they did not contest the child support, as Alex had confirmed the paternity of the children, they felt the rest of the settlement was completely unfair. Steve stood up, saying, Your Honor, I must protest this award. It's unconscionable. You're effectively bankrupting Mr. Fielding. He's the innocent party here. The judge looked at Steve and replied, Objection overruled, Counselor. I purposefully made these awards stringent. Men like Mr. Fielding need to learn that mistreating a spouse will not be tolerated in my jurisdiction. With that, court adjourned. Alex and Steve left the courthouse in total disbelief. Steve suggested they could file an appeal, but warned it would take a couple of years to be heard. In the meantime, Alex had to make the required transfers as mandated by the judge. Over the next week, Alex began transferring money, stocks, and property to Alice as required. 
One of the hardest parts for him was missing his children. He had to borrow heavily to give Alice cash for her share of the business. Finally, Alex had completed all the required transfers and had to move into a small room in the business he had been using for storage. He installed a bathroom and a small bed and chair. His income was now barely enough to cover his personal expenses. The week after the divorce was finalized, Alice put their home up for sale. About three weeks after the divorce, a strange car pulled up in front of the cafe. A man no one had seen before came into the building and asked for a cup of coffee. He sat drinking and looking around, finally asking the waitress, Brandy, for Alex. Alex approached the table, and the man stood, offering his hand. Mr. Fielding, I don't know if you want to talk to me or not, but I thought I would come down and see you. Perhaps we could commiserate for a moment. I heard about your divorce and thought you might need a friendly person to share your frustrations with. I was Alice's first husband. She and her judge nearly bankrupted me, just as I heard they did to you. She was awarded a little over 80% of our assets when I caught her and Jason together and decided to divorce her. I didn't have the money to file an appeal, so I just paid and moved on. I have to admit, I was happy when she married you so I could stop paying alimony, but I really wish I had the courage to speak to you before you tied the knot. She took me for almost a million dollars and managed to spend it all in about 18 months. By the time I got the money to file an appeal, it seemed pointless since all the money was gone. At times, I think she might have moved it offshore, but I've never been able to prove it. I suspect she and the judge were involved. I never caught them together, but about three months after our divorce, she took a cruise and I found out the judge was on the same ship. It seemed suspicious, but I couldn't prove anything. A friend at the bank mentioned she withdrew a large amount just before that trip. She spent almost $100,000 that month, and shortly after, money began draining from her accounts until it was all gone. She then moved back here with her grandmother, and you know the rest. I'm sorry you got caught up in her web, but I didn't think you would believe me if I reached out. I admit I wanted her to marry so I could stop the alimony payments. For what it's worth, Mr. Fielding, I'm truly sorry. The man stood up, leaving $3 on the table. Use that for the coffee, please, and let the waitress keep the rest. Good luck. Alex was despondent after the divorce. He let himself go, wearing unkempt clothes and shaving very rarely. He missed his children terribly. His employees began to watch him with worried expressions, appearing more protective and concerned. Brandy took it upon herself to keep his little room tidy. She had been living with Mrs. Fowler for almost two years in a maid's quarters and helped her in exchange for reduced rent. Alex, Mrs. Fowler doesn't mind if I help you or if I come home later than before, she said. I still have time to cook her dinner and do the cleaning I agreed to do for her. Now just let me take care of this. I have work to do. Alex decided it was easier to leave her alone than to argue. So he walked outside and never brought it up again. Mrs. Fowler began coming into the cafe more frequently and always talked to Alex when she did. Shortly after the divorce, she had come in, and while sharing a cup of coffee, she said, Alex, I'm only going to say this once, but I have to tell you. I'm sorry she treated you this way. I'm not surprised, though. I believe Alice makes her living off the men in her life. I prayed she wouldn't hurt you, but I guess my prayers weren't answered this time. You know you're special to me, and if you ever need anything, all you have to do is ask. I mean anything, money, help, whatever it may be. If I can assist you, I will. Finally, after two months, Marion had reached her breaking point and cornered Alex after they closed. Damn it, Alex. When are you going to snap out of it? I divorced a cheating man, and I know how much it hurts, but I didn't let myself wallow in self-pity. If you fall down, cry if it hurts, but then get up and move forward. Right now, you're more of a problem than a help around here. I know this is your business, but it won't be for long if you don't get your act together. I know the liquor we serve is yours, but that doesn't mean you need to drink it all before we can sell it. Why don't you get some sleep for a change instead of crawling into that nightly bottle? Take a few days off, go to a resort, or take a trip. Forget about everything for a while, then come back and take charge again. Alex felt tears welling up again as Marion confronted him. He looked at her and said, I know you're right, Marion, but I just can't. I miss the kids. God, how I miss them. Not seeing them unless Alice is standing there, watching, 
unable to act as a father should. It pains me to think that Alice has been feeding them false narratives about me. Three weeks ago, Sam asked me why I tried to shoot mommy's friend and if I was going to hurt them, too. That statement cut deep. Alex got up and walked into his dimly lit room. I saw him reaching for his bottle as he closed the door. The next morning, Alex arrived at the cafe looking clean and well-groomed. Marin and Brandy sighed with relief as Brandy brought him a fresh cup of coffee and placed it in his favorite chair by the cash register. Later, Pablo, my hired farmhand, entered the cafe. He approached Alex and said, Patron, I have done a lot for you because you've done much for me, but I cannot continue like this. My wife and family need time, too. I have worked many weeks without a break, and they are saddened. We know you've lost your family, but this isn't a reason to stop living and fulfilling your responsibilities. A man must hold his head high and do what is expected of him. My wife wants to visit her family. It isn't a busy time now, and we ask if this can be arranged. I've spoken with Jose, and he says he can handle much of my work while we are gone, if you would allow it. Alex looked at Pablo and gestured for him to take a seat. Please have a seat, Pablo. He turned to Brandy and asked her to bring Pablo a cup of coffee. Then, he reached into his pocket, took out his wallet, and began filling out a check. After finishing, he handed it to Pablo and said, I'm sorry for how I've let things slip. I know you've been working much harder than I should have required. My parents and I appreciate everything you've done. You, Marion, Brandy, and all my friends have taken good care of me. Now I want to live up to what you should expect from me. Take this check and tell your wife you both have two weeks to visit her family or do anything else you'd like. Have a good trip, my friend. When Pablo saw the check, his face turned pale. But patron, this is too much. I know how much Miss Alice took, and you shouldn't give me this. Alex smiled and replied, Yes, I should, Pablo. I've taken advantage of you and the others, and I intend to make it up to all of you. Take the money, and go kiss your children for me. Enjoy your time. Later that afternoon, Pablo's wife came into the cafe. She approached Alex, hugged him, and kissed him on the cheek. Looking into his eyes, she said, Thank you, patron. You are too good to us. Tears glistened in her eyes as she turned to leave. Brandy had only been working at the cafe for about a year, but had also taken on much of Alex's workload. That evening, as she was getting ready to go home, he asked her to sit with him for a moment. He handed her three $100 bills and said, by now, you've heard about what I gave Pablo. You haven't been here long, but you deserve a bonus for all your help and concern. I hope you'll take this money and buy yourself something nice. I wish I could give you more. Brandy stared at the money, and Alex noticed her eyes welling up. With a smile, she said, Thank you, Alex, but you really shouldn't have done this. I know you don't have the money. Please, keep it. She tried to hand it back to him, but he jumped back and insisted, no, you deserve this and more. All of you deserve a bonus for the way I've been moping around and taking advantage of you. I will try to do better, but at least I can do this small thing to show my appreciation. Throughout that day and the next, Alex gave bonuses to all his employees. The last person he spoke to was Marin. He asked her to sit with him after closing that evening while they enjoyed a beer. Marin sat quietly, watching Alex with concern. She feared he would give her more money than he could afford. Alex leaned back in his chair and said, I expect you know what I want to talk to you about. I've been giving everyone bonuses, and now it's your turn. I couldn't decide what to do about you. Without you, I would never have been this successful, and I wouldn't have this fine establishment. I don't think mere money would suffice to show how important you are to me. Alex reached into his bag and placed a contract on the table in front of Marin. A contract has already been signed by me that increases your salary here. It gives you a 10% share in any profits generated by the cafe or restaurant for as long as you choose to work here. This is in addition to your agreed-upon salary and formalizes your position as manager of the establishment. Alex continued to progress and slowly regained nearly his former level of happiness. However, everyone noticed that when young children were in the cafe or playing outside, he became very morose staring at them with longing that filled the room with his despair. Fifteen months after his divorce, Alex was opening the cafe when he heard sirens. An ambulance flashed past the building and turned left onto the next street. He walked down the block and turned toward the now-stopped ambulance. 
When he saw where it had halted, he broke into a run. He reached the front door of Mrs. Fowler's home just as it was thrown open. He stepped back as the attendant wheeled a gurney out, with hope lying on it, pale and breathing heavily, as the four bag dripped its life-giving fluid into her vein. When Hope saw Alex standing there, she made the attendant stop and took his hand. He stood looking down at her while the attendant bounced nervously from foot to foot, urging them to hurry. Brandy walked up to the head of the gurney, dressed in a thin gown, tears streaming down her face as she tried to comfort Hope. Hope looked at Alex and pulled him closer. In a faint, wavering voice, she said, Alex, you were the grandson I never had. I'm so sorry for everything, but now it's time for you to move on. You and Brandy should. Hope's hand fell limply from his, and her head turned slightly on the gurney. One of the attendants pushed him aside and began working on Hope. They ripped open her gown and started CPR, but despite their efforts, it was no use. Finally, they stopped and covered her face, gently placing the gurney into the ambulance and driving away. By that time, a small crowd had gathered to witness the scene. Tears streamed down Alex's cheeks, mirroring Brandy's anguish. Noticing how she was dressed, he reached for her and gently guided her back into the house and to her room. She was crying so hard she could hardly stand. When Alex started to leave her, she grabbed him, pleading, Alex, please stay with me. What will I do now? I love that woman like my own mother, and now she's gone. How will we get by without her? Alex stayed with Brandy, gently holding her until her sobs subsided. When he finally rose to leave, he turned to her and said, Brandy, you don't have to come in today if you don't want. We understand. Oh, she said, it's my job to be there, and I won't desert you. Besides, I promised. Don't worry, I'll be there soon. Now go while I clean up and get dressed. Most of the town felt sadness when the news circulated about Mrs. Fowler. She had lived there all her life, and very few people in Steelville were older than she had been. Everyone missed her wit and cheerful greetings. However, they all agreed that if she had to go, a heart attack was the best option for her. She left this world quickly. She had been too vibrant a person to sit and wither away with a long illness like some people are forced to endure. On the day of the funeral, Alice and the children arrived in a small pickup truck, its bed loaded and covered with a tarp. After the services, she drove the truck to Mrs. Fowler's house and began unloading it. While she was taking their belongings inside, Brandy walked in. Alice turned to her and said, What are you doing here in my house? Oh yes, you're that girl grandma was letting stay with her. Well, get your things and get out. I don't need you here. Brandy ran from the house in tears, seeking refuge with Alex in his room at the cafe. She pounded on the door until he opened it, and she fell into his arms. After calming down, she explained what Alice had said. Alex, I wasn't supposed to say anything to you for a while, but I need your help. We need to call Mr. Jensen right now. Would you please help me? It took them almost an hour to get Steve Jensen on the phone. When Alex handed the phone to Brandy, he glanced over, and she gave him a look that suggested he should leave the room. He stepped outside and listened as she spoke with Steve. A short time later, he heard the call end. Brandy walked out to the patio and sat at one of the restaurant tables with Alex. Steve and a sheriff will be here shortly. Can I sit here with you until then? In a few minutes, they heard two cars drive up. Steve soon walked onto the patio, papers in hand. He looked at Brandy and said, If you and Alex are ready, let's get this over with. All four of them walked down the block to the Fowler house. As Brandy took a deep breath and opened the door to enter, she was barely two steps in when Alice emerged from the kitchen. Upon seeing Brandy, Alice snapped, What are you doing back here? I thought I told you to get your things out of your quarters and get out of my house. Steve Jensen and the deputy sheriff were present, and Steve looked at the sheriff. The deputy approached Alice and said, Miss Fowler. Alice nodded and replied, Yes? What do you want? The deputy handed her a piece of paper. Miss Fowler, that is a restraining order. It orders you to keep at least 300 feet away from this residence and the residences or businesses of Mr. Fielding and Miss Brandy Hoover. I understand your grandmother has just passed away, but it was her wish that only Mr. Fielding, Miss Hoover, or anyone they choose to admit enter these premises from the time of her death until after her estate is settled. 
What do you mean by that? Alice exclaimed. This is my house. I am the only living relative of my grandmother. And since she is dead, this is my property. You cannot keep a person from their own property. Steve interjected. Alice, I'm afraid this is not your property. I am the executor of the estate, responsible for ensuring your grandmother's last will and testament is executed as she desired. The ownership of this property will not be decided until Miss Fowler's will is probated. Until then, it is her desire, upheld by the probate judge, that the only persons allowed on this property are, as the deputy stated, you need to load your belongings back into your truck and go back wherever you came from. The deputy and Steve stayed until Alice and her truck were just a small speck on the highway. Steve turned to Brandy and Alex, saying, Well, if she gives any more trouble, let me know. I don't know when we will start probate, but it's usually around a year before these things are settled. I will be in touch. He and the deputy left. After that day, life settled down for the citizens of Steelville. Eventually, both Brandy and Alex received a letter in the mail informing them they needed to be present for the reading of Mrs. Hope Fowler's will. On the appointed day, they arrived at the judge's chambers. As they entered, Alex noticed Alice's first husband walking into the office as well. When the three of them entered the conference room, they saw Alice and Jason already seated at the table. Alice jumped to her feet, exclaiming, What are they doing here? I thought we were here to award me my grandmother's belongings. Steve had just begun to answer her question when the judge walked into the room. No, Miss Fowler, we are here to comply with the terms of your late grandmother's will. We will distribute her property according to her wishes. The judge took a seat at the head of the table and began speaking. He covered a lot of legal minutiae, then said, Okay, the legalities are out of the way. All of the known debts of Mrs. Fowler have been satisfied, and it is now time to distribute the remainder of her estate to her heirs. First, Miss Fowler, I have a letter for you from your grandmother. In her will, she says it will explain her reasons for distributing her property as she has. I have been instructed to paraphrase the contents of this letter for everyone present. Mrs. Fowler feels that not only were you, and these are the words I was instructed to use in this instance, of the lowest sort, but you were also despicable, dishonest, and morally lacking. She loved you as a grandchild but abhorred you as a person. Your actions from puberty until now were not those of a Christian or moral person. She is attempting to make some of the things you have done to others in your life right with her bequests in this will. To Mr. Thomas Sensony, Alice's first husband, she bequeathed $750,000. This is to partially repay him for the damage done to him in the divorce. Secondly, to you, Alice. She bequeaths only those monies and belongings you have taken from her premises and bank accounts during your life. As you know, she never complained or filed charges against you for writing checks on her accounts or taking jewelry and other valuables from her home. All those possessions and funds are now legally yours. When the judge finished speaking, Alice jumped angrily to her feet. What? How dare you? I never stole anything in my life. I lived with that old woman and cared for her. Occasionally, I may have written some checks for necessary things, but that is all. The judge interrupted Alice's tirade, saying, Miss Fowler, if you do not compose yourself properly, I will ask security to escort you from this room. I have more business to conduct that may or may not be of interest to you, but as long as you are a party to these proceedings, you will comport yourself properly. Now, to continue, the judge said, Miss Brandy Hoover is awarded the sum of $100,000 in cash and the right to continue living in the maid's quarters of Mrs. Fowler's former residence until such time as she marries or chooses to leave. The only stipulation for this request is that she continues to provide the same services to the new owner of the property that she did to Mrs. Fowler. Those services are spelled out in this document. The judge handed a legal paper to Brandy and, to his surprise, to Alex. There is one bequest that Mrs. Fowler has made that she demands be kept secret until certain future events occur. Other than that, the balance of her estate, with an approximate value of $1.06 million, goes to Mr. Alex Fielding. Once again, with a screech of pure rage, Alice launched herself at Alex. She struck him twice and scratched his face deeply before the bailiff could stop her. The judge looked at her and said, Bailiff, place this woman in custody and charge her with contempt of court, 
assault, and battery with intent to do bodily harm upon the person of Mr. Alex Fielding. While you're at it, escort this gentleman who arrived with Miss Fowler out as well, please. After Brandy had cleaned Alex's face, the judge said, Now, if we can continue. Once again, as I was saying, the balance of Mrs. Fowler's estate goes to Mr. Alex Fielding. There are instructions to clarify the reasoning behind this award. These reasons are as follows. Mr. Fielding, even as a child, treated Miss Fowler as one of his family. For the entire time he resided in Steelville, he would voluntarily come to Mrs. Fowler's home to perform maintenance repairs, mow her yard, and run errands for her. He never asked for or accepted payment for these services. Additionally, like Mr. Sensony, Mr. Fielding was treated unfairly by his then-wife, Alice Fielding, and was unjustly denied a fair division of assets when they divorced. Mrs. Fowler felt that Mr. Fielding was the grandson she was never fortunate enough to have, and she wanted to let him know in a tangible way how much she loved him. The only encumbrance on the property for Mr. Fielding is that, as previously stated, Miss Brandy Hoover is to continue living in the maid's quarters and provide the same services to Mr. Fielding that she provided to Mrs. Fowler. Alex and Brandy sat in stunned silence as the judge finished speaking. As he organized his papers, the judge continued, Mr. Cincinnati, Mr. Fielding, I know it is too late, but I want you to know that Mrs. Fowler had hired a private investigator. Somehow, she formed the opinion that the judge in your divorce proceedings was not entirely unbiased. Unfortunately, he passed away before she could make her findings public. She wanted you to know that what she discovered was enough to get him disbarred and perhaps even face jail time. It appears he had been a secret lover of your wife almost from the time she entered college. There was evidence that she traded favors for lenient judgments, shall we say. I hope you all have a good day and that these bequests help right the wrongs done to you. After the title to his new home had been properly recorded, Alex moved his meager belongings from the small room he occupied in the back of the store to his new abode. The very next morning, he hired a contractor to enlarge the apartment he had been living in, adding a small kitchenette along with a living room and bedroom. Everyone wondered what he was doing and why, but he would not say. Finally, when the additions were completed, he called all his staff into the cafe in the mid-afternoon. Jose was there in his threadbare but clean work clothes. He looked around and then said, You all have been my very good friends for a long time, as well as my very good employees. Jose has not worked for me long, but he is a very hard-working man. When I was feeling down after my divorce, I hired him to assist Pablo. He is dedicated and good-hearted, and he and his wife have just welcomed a new baby. I cannot, in good conscience, let them continue to live in that old trailer they are renting from George Jones. Jose, I have enlarged the rooms I was living in, and it would honor me if you and your family would move into them as part of your salary. I will furnish those quarters just as I now furnish the apartment Pablo and his family occupy. Jose stood staring at Alex while all the other employees smiled and patted him on the back. Finally, he regained his voice and stammered, Thank you, patron. You will not be sorry. You have honored me and my family in this way. If there is ever anything we can do for you, you just have to ask. If I may, patron, I would like to go tell my margarita about this generous thing you have done. Alex smiled and said, By all means, here are my truck keys. Why don't you and Pablo go begin moving your things into your new home? Oh, senor, we could not. We are still working. Jose stammered. Yes, you are, Jose, and this is my order to you. Move your things into your new home and take all of tomorrow to enjoy it and help your wife arrange things to her satisfaction. The next morning, when Alex came into view walking from his new home to his business, he saw a smiling Margarita standing on the patio. He walked to her and said, Good morning, Margarita. You are up early. Is your new home satisfactory? Margarita handed Alex a cup of coffee in one of the cafe cups and said, Oh yes, senor. It is magnificent. We thank you so much. How can we repay you? You cannot, Margarita. Your husband has been a good and loyal employee and worked hard for me. That is repayment enough for knowing I have provided your little one a safer and healthier place to grow up in. Over the next two weeks, Alex noticed Margarita working in the kitchen. One morning, he came into the cafe and saw that the menu had changed, now offering Mexican dishes alongside traditional American fare. He walked into the kitchen and saw Margarita 
happily cooking while Marin watched. Margarita's daughter was joyfully chatting away in a small playpen just inside the door to Jose's quarters. Do you mind telling me what is going on here? Alex asked. I've seen you in the kitchen now for two weeks, and this morning I find the menu has changed. What do you think you're doing here? Margarita looked nervous, hanging her head. No, patron, but you have provided such nice rooms for us. Jose and I decided we needed to do more for you than we were, so I cook now. I was a cook in Mexico before we got our green cards and moved here. Alex looked at Marin and asked, What did you have to do with this? Well, Alex, the first week I let her cook a few meals to see how good she was. I gave them for free to some of our regulars. They started coming in and asking for the dishes Margarita had cooked. We decided to expand the menu, and I told her that if you did not want to pay her, I would cover her out of my share of the profits. Our breakfast and lunch traffic has picked up since she started cooking, bringing in more of the local Mexican workers. Alex laughed and said, Okay, you all win. How about you bring me special number three for my lunch? I want to see just how good this new cook of ours is. Once again, things returned to smooth operation and Alex was enjoying his life. He and Brandy walked to work many mornings and in the evenings, if she didn't have a date, they would talk and watch TV or read together. They became comfortable with each other, sharing moments in the house. From time to time, one or the other would inadvertently see the other in a state of undress, leading to thoughts about how attractive the other was. As summer progressed, Alex noticed Brandy wearing increasingly casual and revealing clothes, which he assumed was due to the warm weather. The house was always spotless, and whenever they ate at home, Brandy would cook delicious meals. By winter, they had settled into a very comfortable relationship. Then the swine flu scare came. Alex was too busy to get even the regular flu shot, and he didn't fall into the high-priority groups for the vaccine. Neither did Brandy, of course. You can guess what happened. Alex became very ill, suffering through the symptoms. One evening, he found himself frequently in the bathroom of his master suite. He didn't hear Brandy come into the room, but when she saw him bent over the toilet, she realized he was unwell. After he stopped throwing up, she helped him back to bed, bathing his face with cool water and making him chicken soup. Her tender care helped him slowly recover. Finally, five days after falling ill, he was able to sit in his sunroom and watch TV. Although too weak to work, he could at least read. Brandy came into the room with his lunch, and he realized she had been by his side throughout his illness. He had awakened at times to see her lying beside him, trying to make him comfortable, feeling embarrassed while Brandy walked toward him with a light lunch of soup and a sandwich. He noticed she stumbled and almost dropped the tray. He stood quickly to help her. Her face was pale and sweaty. Brandy, you're sick too. Why are you doing all this work? He asked, concerned. Brandy looked at him for a moment before turning away and rushing to her room. Alex heard her in the bathroom, and he rushed to her side to help her. He held her while she struggled then gently washed her face and guided her to bed. For the next six days, he returned the favor she had shown him, nursing her through her bout of the flu. One day, after Brandy was starting to feel better, she wore one of her lighter gowns. As she lay there, Alex caught a glimpse down the neckline and felt a rush of conflicting emotions. He scolded himself, wondering how he could be thinking of such things when Brandy was still recovering. He firmly believed that a man shouldn't mix personal feelings with professional relationships. Brandy noticed Alex's reaction, and a small smile almost escaped her lips, though thankfully, Alex didn't see it. He rarely got to spend time with his children anymore, despite having more liberal visitation rights after the divorce. Alice would put up every roadblock she could to prevent their visits. After the will had been read, Alex had obtained reports on Alice's actions and tried to recoup some of what she had taken in the divorce, but it seemed she had spent everything. Though he was successful in getting more time with his kids, he was supposed to have them every other weekend and one month in the summer. As they spent more time together, the children began to relax around him, realizing he wasn't the ogre their mother had claimed he was. It surely helped that Brandy was often around. She and the children became friendly, and they often asked about her when she wasn't there. One Sunday evening, after returning the children to their mother, Alex found Brandy sitting in the den with a glass of wine and a book. He joined her, pouring himself a glass of his favorite scotch, 
and they enjoyed each other's company in comfortable silence, exchanging glances. For the past several months, Alex had noticed that Brandy hadn't been going out at all. As far as he could remember, she had stopped dating shortly after he moved in with her. He looked at her, appreciating her beauty, and without thinking, he said, Brandy, could I ask you a personal question? Brandy looked up, feeling her stomach twist at the seriousness in his tone. Of course, Alex, you can ask me anything. I don't mean to pry, but I've been watching you and thinking about what a wonderful person you are. You're so great with the kids, and it's a shame you don't have any of your own. I think you would make a fantastic mother and wife. I remembered you haven't been dating that I know of for several months. Is there something wrong that I could help with? Brandy looked at him with a haunted expression and stood up so quickly that she dropped her book. Tears filled her eyes as she ran to her room. Alex sat there in shock for a moment before following her. He knocked on the door but received no answer, so he entered anyway. Brandy was lying across her bed, crying, and it tore his heart out to see her like that. Brandy, I'm sorry. I know it's none of my business, but I worry about you. You're wasting your life hiding here when you should be out living and enjoying your youth. I didn't mean to upset you. I just want you to be happy. She looked up at him, her face stained with tears. Damn you. I have what I want, but you're too blind to see it. Just leave me alone, please. Alex stood at the door, feeling perplexed. I'm sorry, Brandy. I guess I overstepped. I just care about you, and I hear the men in town always trying to get dates. I wondered what had happened. Turning away, he walked back to the den, staring out the window. Suddenly, his scotch didn't taste as good, and the day felt a little dimmer. Shortly after, Brandy walked slowly into the den, tears streaming down her face. Damn you, Alex. Compared to you, all the other men are nothing. Every date I went on, I found myself comparing them to you, and they never measured up. I love you. I kept hoping you would see me as more than just an employee. I was fooling myself. I'll leave as soon as I can find a place. Alex sat in shock, watching as Brandy turned and ran from the room. He followed her to her door, but this time it was locked, and she wouldn't open it. He could still hear Brandy crying and it made him feel terrible. He hadn't considered the age difference before. He was 33, and she was 22. He liked her and looked forward to seeing her every morning, spending far too much time talking to her and stealing glances while they worked together or while she moved around the house. He never seriously thought she would be interested in someone like him. Returning to his den, he opened a bottle of Glenlivet and drank straight from it. He didn't remember falling asleep. When he woke at dawn, he felt Brandy place a blanket over him. She gasped when he opened his eyes and found her face just inches from his as she tucked the blanket around him. They locked eyes for a moment, and as Brandy started to rise, Alex instinctively reached up, wrapping his arms around her and pulling her down. She lost her balance and fell on top of him. Alex, what are you doing? Stop, she said, pushing herself up from his chest. But he held her tightly enough that she could only rise a little. Looking deeply into her eyes, he leaned in and kissed her. After several moments, Brandy pushed away again. But this time he let her go, twisting his legs off the couch and pulling her down next to him. Brandy, he said, I've been feeling more and more for you. I know you've caught me staring at you across the store. I've seen you watch me and frown. I've been falling in love with you for months, but I didn't think I stood a chance. I'm 11 years older than you and I thought you were only interested in dating men your own age. I valued our friendship too much to risk it. I'd rather have you as a friend than not have you in my life at all. Brandy smiled and climbed onto his lap, bending down to kiss him again. Oh, Alex, sometimes you are so blind. It's no wonder Alice got away with so much. Alex stiffened, and Brandy saw the tears forming in his eyes. She started crying too. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. How could I hurt you like this? I didn't mean to. Brandy, he said softly, pulling her back against his chest. He gave her a gentle kiss. I've been in love with a dream, thinking we were just friends when I liked you far more than that. I let myself be convinced you had changed because I wanted to believe in you. I guess I was foolish, but when you trust someone, it's easy to overlook their flaws. I know you didn't mean to hurt me, but it did. I'll always carry that hurt of betrayal. It taught me a lesson. 
I struggle with trust now, often wondering if my friends and customers are being honest with me. I hate feeling this way, but it's hard not to. The only people I trust completely are you, Pablo Marin, and my family. It's tough when the only people you trust are the ones working for you. Oh honey, I'm so sorry, Brandy said. You know we all love you and would do anything for you. You trust some of your other friends too, don't you? Alex smiled. Well, yes, but it's not the same as it was with Alice or with you three. Brandy shrieked playfully, pushing herself off Alex's lap. Look at the time. We're already late for work. Hurry and change your clothes. Alex glanced at the clock and exclaimed, Damn, I'll just be a few minutes. Call the store and let Marin know we're on our way. He hurried to the master suite for his shower. Hearing Brandy pick up the phone, she began dialing, saying, No, he didn't. He asked me a really silly question last night, and I got emotional. You know how I get when I'm on my period. I just lost it and ran to my room. The next thing I knew, Alex was there, checking if I was okay. I was still so hurt and angry that I yelled at him. I told him all the other men I dated came in second best compared to him. I told him I loved him and kept hoping he'd see that someday. I was so upset this morning that I was planning to look for a new place to stay. I covered him with a blanket because I thought he had drunk too much and slept on the couch. When I woke him up, he pulled me down and kissed me. What? Brandy giggled. No, we just talked. He said he had been falling in love with me for months, but was afraid to say anything because he thought he was too old for me and that I deserved better. I cried, and he kissed me more. I was sitting on his lap, talking to him about us and Alice when I realized what time it was. No, we're on our way. Alex was walking out of the bedroom when Brandy heard him. Here he comes. We're on our way. See you soon, she said before hanging up the phone and smiling at him. Brandy jumped up from the chair and ran to Alex, giving him a quick kiss on the lips. Are you ready to go now, honey? I'll cook your breakfast at the store. Alex smiled and wrapped his arm around Brandy as he led her toward the door. Since his house was only a block from the business, they usually walked together. Whenever they passed each other, they'd reach out and touch, drawing smiles from the customers who noticed. It was clear something special had blossomed between them, and the townspeople were pleased to see them openly acknowledge their feelings for each other. By noon, the little store and market had already seen more business than usual, as word spread quickly about their new relationship. The next day, during one of Alex's trips to Sam's Club, he asked Brandy if she would accompany him to help with shopping. This wasn't unusual, as he occasionally took one of the women or Pablo, but today he seemed quieter than usual. By the time they pulled into the parking lot, Brandy felt a sense of apprehension. Brandy, Alex said, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly, I've been thinking about our conversations over the last couple of days. I know we haven't dated formally, but I've known you for four years, and we've worked closely together for three of those. I think we know each other very well. The kids really like you. He took a deep breath, a look of uncertainty crossing his face. I would like for you to marry me, if you'll consider it. We can buy a ring when we get inside. When he saw the blank look on Brandy's face, he felt a sinking sensation in his stomach. Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. Just forget. Don't you dare take it back. Brandy interrupted, her eyes bright with tears. Yes, yes, I'll marry you. And yes, we can pick out a ring today. She threw her arms around him and beamed through her tears. After a moment of holding each other, Alex gently pushed her back. Honey, we should go inside. Marin needs some things for the lunch rush. Hand in hand, they walked into Sam's club, leaning on each other. Brandy couldn't help but admire the ring as they made their way to the jewelry counter. After a bit of searching, she found the perfect ring, and to her delight, it fit perfectly. Once they completed their shopping, they headed home. For the first time, they were a bit somber given that the truck's captain's chairs meant Brandy had to settle for holding Alex's hand rather than sitting next to him as lovers often do. When they arrived at the store, Alex backed up to the loading dock and as he unloaded supplies, he noticed Marin shriek and grab Brandy's hand, lifting it to admire the ring. Well, it's about time you did this. We were all about to give up on you, she exclaimed before pulling Brandy into a hug. After the embrace, Marin walked over to Alex giving him a big hug too. 
She pulled out her cell phone and began calling regular customers and friends to share the news about their engagement. Brandy set the wedding date for six weeks after her engagement, choosing to hold the ceremony and reception in the restaurant on a Monday evening, which was a day they didn't serve dinner. Her parents were fine with the arrangements, and the restaurant was overflowing with family and the couple's closest friends, leaving no room for additional guests. Alex and Brandy were so well regarded in town that they had arranged to use the local VFW for the reception dance, where all well-wishers were welcome. The public reception was set to begin at 8 p.m., giving everyone time to witness the couple's marriage, participate in pictures, and enjoy a meal with the bride and groom. After dinner, everyone departed for the VFW, which was located just three blocks away. During the cake-cutting ceremony, Steve Jensen, the attorney, approached the table beside the bride and groom. Quiet, please, he said, gaining everyone's attention. Before we enter into more festivities and truly celebrate this wonderful couple, I have a duty to perform for the court. Curiosity buzzed through the crowd, wondering what a court matter had to do with a wedding. Steve continued, As you all know, when Mrs. Fowler passed away, she attempted to rectify the wrongs done to Alex and Alice's first husband during their divorce. She also made provisions for Brandy, allowing her to remain in her room in the house Alex now owns. There's one more bequest that had a delay in awarding the benefits. It is now my duty as an officer of the court to carry out Hope Fowler's last request. Reaching inside his suit jacket, Steve pulled out an envelope and opened it. I have been instructed to read this letter in its entirety at the wedding reception of Alex Fielding and Brandy Hoover. Gasps of surprise filled the room as everyone realized the significance of the letter. Well, Alex, it's about time you did something right for a change. I've watched you and Brandy dance around each other for months. I don't know how long I've been gone, but it's high time you married that girl. I wanted to keep you from marrying Alice, but I couldn't. You could have been happy, but I just didn't believe she would change. I do believe that for the first two years of your marriage, she stayed true to you, as my investigators found no issues. Unfortunately, as we all know, that changed. You have a keeper now, my boy. Love and prosper. I know you have more important things to do than listen to an old woman talk to you from the grave, so I'll be brief. I loved you both as my own and am so happy for you. In honor of this occasion, I want to provide for your honeymoon. I left this final bequest for that purpose. I want you to take a world trip and not return until this $100,000 and its interest are completely spent. Just so you know, had you two not married each other, this amount would have gone to any children you might have had with your previous spouses. Regardless, know that this old woman loved you both and wants you to be happy together. The audience fell silent as Steve handed the check to Alex, and many attendees wiped away tears, including Brandy. In the months that followed, even Alice seemed to soften. She began allowing the children to spend more time with Alex and Brandy. Although Alex always had to pick them up and drop them off, he was happy to do so cherishing the time he got to spend with them. While Alice never came to the car to talk, Alex could see her through the door when he picked up the kids. She seemed less inclined to leave her home. About 11 months after Alex and Brandy married, they received a call from Child Protective Services. Mr. Fielding, we have your children in foster care. If you wish, they can be released into your custody if you arrange to pick them up, the worker said. Alex was shocked. What happened to their mother? She's supposed to be caring for them. Did something happen? Are they okay? He questioned, anxiety rising in his voice. Relax, Mr. Fielding. Your children are fine, and so is their mother. She is too ill to care for them any longer, and they want to come live with you if you agree. Of course, I want them. What do you mean, too ill to care for them? What happened to her? Alex pressed. I'm afraid I cannot disclose her health problems but perhaps you can obtain that information directly from her. She has requested you visit her before you take the children home. She is currently at St. John's Medical Center here in town. Now, if there's nothing else, you can stop by our office and a caseworker will accompany you to pick up your children after the proper paperwork is completed. Brandy watched Alex as he spoke on the phone, her expression a mix of confusion and concern. As soon as he hung up, she asked what had happened. After he explained, she responded, Of course we want the kids. Why would anyone think otherwise? Do you want to leave now? Yes, let's go and see if we can get them settled in time for bed, 
Alex replied. They were both taken aback by the amount of paperwork involved in picking up the children, but they eventually completed it and were directed to the home of the older couple caring for the kids. When the door opened, Sam looked up and immediately rushed past the foster family and caseworker to hug his father. Julie quickly followed, clinging to Brandy tightly. I told them you would want us. I knew Mama was wrong about that. Can we please go home now? I don't like it here, Sam said, looking up at Alex. Alex smiled and replied, Yes, we can go home now. You and your sister grab your things, and we'll head out. On the way home, Brandy noticed Alex's troubled expression. She reached over and gently placed her hand on his thigh. Honey, what's the matter? We have the kids, and everything will be okay now. Why do you look like that? Alex sighed and said, The caseworker mentioned that Alice wanted us to visit her in the hospital. I just don't know if I want to, and I'm not sure I could handle it even if I did. Sweetheart, it's over between you and her. If she's too ill to care for the kids, don't you think we should at least do this one thing for her? After all, she is their mother, Brandy urged. Alex sighed again and reluctantly agreed. He turned the car toward the hospital, driving in silence until they parked. Okay, kids, let's go see your mother so you can say goodbye for now, he said as he looked in the back seat. Both children hesitated, appearing frightened. Sam began to cry. Okay, guys, why don't you want to see your mother? What's going on? Alex asked. Julie looked at Alex and said, Daddy, Mama told us we weren't supposed to touch her or kiss her and not to touch anything she had been using. She said she didn't want to make us sick. We're scared she will make us sick if we go. Do we have to? She said she was really sick and that people should stay away from her. Alex glanced at Brandy, then reassured the kids. No, you don't have to touch her, but we promised we would see her before we took you home. Brandy and I will go but you can stay outside the room if you want. Now, let's go. When they reached the hospital reception area, the volunteer directed them to the hospice unit. She wouldn't disclose why Alice was there, but said one of the workers could assist them. Upon arriving at the right wing of the hospital, they were instructed not to touch anything Alice had been using and were guided to her room. Alice looked up as they entered and offered a faint smile. Alex, thank you for coming. I could always count on you, couldn't I? You don't know how much I hoped things could have been different between us. I tried so hard, but I just couldn't be what you needed. You deserved so much more. She glanced behind Alex at the children peering in from the hallway and continued, At least we made some wonderful kids. I always loved you for that, and I'm so sorry I didn't let you see them more. I was just so angry with you for a long time, feeling like you were trying to take away things I needed. I thought you deserved to be without those things you wanted. Alice's voice weakened as she added, I'm even sorry for how I treated you during the divorce. I guess you know by now that I won't be around much longer. You were right when you said I needed to be more careful, or my lifestyle would catch up with me. I guess it did. They didn't tell you, but I have serious health issues. I just want you to take care of my kids for me and help them remember me. Brandy had tears in her eyes while Alice spoke. Alex asked Brandy and the kids to step out for a moment, and they complied. He moved closer to Alice's bedside and said, Alice, if you think I'm going to say something nice to you in these last moments, that's not happening. To be honest, it's quite a relief to see you facing the consequences of your choices. I hoped for a change, but I see now that you haven't changed at all. You've always been like this. He continued, As for your claims of love, I can't believe those words. You may be on your deathbed, but I won't accept any sentiment you express now. Since our divorce, I wanted to see you face the consequences of your actions, and I'm sorry to say it brings me some satisfaction to witness it today. Brandy and I will love and care for the kids. Goodbye, and I hope you find peace in your final moments. A tear ran down Alice's cheek, and she began to hyperventilate. Alex left the room, and late the next day, he received another phone call from a familiar voice. Mr. Fielding? After Alex confirmed his identity, the man continued, This is Dr. Douglas from St. John's Hospice. I regret to inform you that your ex-wife passed away due to cardiac failure at 3.17 p.m. this afternoon. I'm truly sorry. Her remains have been transferred to Grogan's Chapel for cremation. Please contact them for any further instructions, as you are the only person she listed as an interested party. Goodbye.
Alex and Brandy took care of Alice's final arrangements and had her ashes interred in the Steelville Cemetery alongside her parents and grandmother. Brandy made sure to honor Alice's memory with dignity. Several months later, Alex found himself once again in a hospital room, this time accompanied by his 10-year-old daughter and 9-year-old son. They watched Brandy lying in a hospital bed, smiling down at their newborn brother, Joseph Howard Fielding, who had just been born three hours prior. The happiness they felt was overwhelming, especially when considering how shattered they had been by Alice's death just 18 months earlier. Once again, all was well in Steelville. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.